Hey, Mike here with Canadian Musician Magazine. Right now in the Hilton Hotel with me is uh, one of Canada's most hyped at the moment, rising alt pop stars, Delaney Jane. Debut full-length LP, uh, Dirty Pretty Things, just dropped this morning as we talk and uh, thankfully had, uh, had some time to listen to it. It's sounding great. Uh, which is no surprise given the the singles that uh, that let it off but how's it uh well first of all thanks for doing this i'm sure you're doing a lot of promo these last couple of days but how are you feeling uh well i'm stoked to be here i you know i i've worked so hard and so long on this album so you know i'm really happy to just share my stories and everything that kind of went into putting it together so great to chat with you absolutely the fact that this is an LP I want to start off with, because, of course, within the pop world, hip-hop, R&B, really within popular music in general, even indie bands are doing it now. It, it, everyone, all the talk is it's a singles mm -hmm. industry now in the streaming era. Totally. Um, so I'm wondering for you, and certainly you've had massive success with singles. Like I think you've racked up 400 million streams online already. Yeah, right <laughs> you've you've had some, uh, some massive singles already. You've worked with Tiesto. We're, you've had a very interesting story within the industry already. So the fact this is a debut is uh, maybe misleading for folks who are just, you know, discovering you through this interview or whatever. But the fact that you decided as a pop artist to put out a full length LP, I was just wondering what the thinking is behind that. Was it just that was your artistic vision or was there some other blueprint, I suppose, to, uh, to that strategy? You're you're totally right. Um, you know the way we kind of eat up music nowadays. It's it's so easy to just keep dropping singles, and and the fact that we can do that is great. Um, you know you're not expected to to put out an EP or an album. And I kind of went from dropping singles to dropping an album. I didn't do what most people do, and they you know they put out like a four to six. Uh, EP, but for me, it was it was more about the fact that I I have been doing this for such a long time, and you know, even though I came up in the EDM industry, uh, working with different DJs and producers, it just it felt like the right time for me. And you know, these songs I've been writing and working on for the last uh, I don't know four to five years, and the album really has been the last three years of my life. So I really want to put out a body of work that reflected who I am, why I am the way I am, and and kind of have it all wrapped up into uh, into these songs. So we did it, and here we are. <laughs> of course, the singles like Bad Habit and Throwback have you know been huge commercial successes yeah. so far. Uh, like I said, you've worked with uh, Florida, Tiesto. Um, you, again, we were like a featured vocalist and top line writer for a number of artists before you, yeah. you know, launched your own solo career. So I'm really interested in the story of how this all happened. I'm interested in hearing your story and how you came into this industry. I know you're a Toronto-based artist. Did you grow up here? I I actually grew up in Waterloo, so about an hour from Toronto. And uh, six years ago, I moved to Toronto to attend a private school for performing arts. And that's actually when I moved in next door to Sean Frank. So while I was, you know, doing these 12-hour super intense days at my um, private school program, I just like, I, I don't know, I think I was singing around like the backyard one of the days and then Sean came over to me and was like, hey, like, you you know, your voice sounds really nice. Um, I'm working on this track. Do you want to come in the studio? At the time, the kind of, it looked like a back garage or a shed. It was actually his studio that he was working in. So I, I went in there. We wrote this song together and I remember he called me a couple days later and he's like, D, um, the song got signed to Spinning Records. And I was like, "What is spinning records?" Like, I w I didn't know anything at the time. I was so I was so fresh into it, and that one song is what propelled everything. And then I started doing collabs with, I did um, Shades of Grey with Oliver Heldens. I did La La Land with Dubs. This could be Love with Borges. Heaven with Cashmere. L'Amour Toujours Tiesto. Limitless with Adventure Club. I could go on, but each song kind of led to the next. And, um, you know, I actually, I grew up writing poetry before I ever started singing. I didn't even know I could sing, you know, when I was, when I was little, but, you know, eventually I put two and two together, like I could, I could turn my poetry into music. And so, um, that was a really special moment for me, but 
that being said, I'd always been writing, you know, my own stuff before I started working with DJs. So for me, it was only a matter of time before I dove into my own, um, you know, solo songwriting and performing. When you were, and just to back up again, when you were in that arts focused private school, what were you studying? What was your thoughts then about what you wanted to do? Obviously, you're an artistic kid, you're a talented kid to be doing yeah. that program, but what was the plan then? Is this all part of it or was this is how it's worked out more happenstance that's a really good question because um i had actually taken one year at york university for the acting program and i dropped out because i'm like this is not what i should be doing i just miss music so much in my life uh and then when i got accepted into this other program i thought this is great it's it was more musical theater based but i know that they um they also included dancing so i was taking tap jazz ballet which i grew up as a competitive dancer so it was so nice for me to kind of like be refreshed in all this stuff that i used to do um we had acting for film and television but at the end of the day it was so musical theater based that i still was missing that thing that really set my soul on fire and I got in trouble a lot because I kind of like did my own thing and they wanted to make me into this theater actor and it was a, it's a great, great school. Um, it was a really amazing experience. But again, I was just always brought back to making music. So, you know, I was lucky enough to like be making music with Sean while going to school. I finished school debt free because of the, you know, the EDM stuff I was doing and, um, yeah, I don't know. What a crazy two years that was. <laughs> that very chance meeting, you know, like you said, just happened to move in next door to, yeah. you know, who Sean Frank, who would, like you were saying, would become a regular collaborator as a producer of the new album. Yeah. Uh, did you guys know right off the bat that there was some good synergy there as artistic partners? Like, did uh, essentially how, how quickly did you realize, like, oh, this is someone that's uh, you know, I can make great art with or that can help me reach my vision. Yeah. Um, once we actually got in the studio uh, and he was playing piano and I just started riffing, there was an instant comfort. And before that moment, it was kind of like, hey, you know, we'd say hi, but he had this very mysterious kind of like darker demeanor. I didn't know how to read him. But then as soon as we got in the studio, we just instantly meshed and we became super organic best friends you know before anything else and I think that's what made it so easy to work with him is that there was just this level of trust and also we just we like love the same music we feel the same about music we hear these chords and we love those chords and and we have the same cheese cheese cheeseometer <laughs> like if something's too cheesy we'll both look at each other like no you know like we just vibe on the same wavelength so much when it comes to music so I guess you could say it was pretty instantaneous where was Sean's career at at that point? You were obviously a very new artist, you know. That was your introduction to the music industry. Yeah. What had Sean done to that point? So prior to that moment, Sean had been uh, in a touring band. I think he had just got off um, a worldwide tour opening for Kiss with his band, but then he got locked into a really bad record deal. And basically, you know, the horror stories you sometimes hear about where you're working on something for two years and the, the label never puts the music out. So he, I think that really, um, that really burned him. But then he heard electronic dance music and he was instantly so turned on to, you know, this new sound and he got in the studio, he started producing it himself. I know he, his first big mix, uh, he did a remix of Roy Royals by Lord, which was massive at the time. And he just kept getting so much love on B-Port. So he started off doing remixes and then producing his own solo stuff. And that's kind of when I met him was in the beginning of it all. So we, we started uh, in this EDM scene kind of at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The fact that he would have had that, you know, bad experience on the label front um, kind of leads me to something I was curious about because you're releasing all your music independently. I believe you've started your own imprint label that the that this album is out on yeah. um which is impressive for a new artist to do and to find the success you've had doing it fully independently and if it works out it's a great business mm -hmm. move you know don't have to split yeah, the royalties yeah. with anyone else or at least fewer ways exactly. um is sean's experience on that front and i'm sure also the success you guys had right off the bat commercially 
But in terms of that decision to put this album out, as well as the previous singles independently, mm -hmm. is that what informed this or essentially went, went into that very shrewd business move? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Sean's experience had an impact, but at the end of the day, it was really what I wanted. And are you familiar with AWOL? Uh, the artist or the... It's, uh, oh, not the artist, the, the label. So AWOL, I actually signed with them before I, before I put my, it's worldwide. Yeah, it might have, might have started in LA, I think, but it's now developed everywhere. They just opened an office in Toronto. But, um, so I pretty much signed with them before I put my very first solo single out. And unlike most major labels, they take a much lower percentage, you know, of my project, and I get to maintain full creative control. So, you know, I didn't even know this existed until I think, you know, someone, I can't remember if it was my manager or Sean who brought to the table, and since then we've just grown so much with them, and I'm actually looking at signing um, a bigger deal as they want to make me a more of a, a priority artist, which is awesome, but they really allow people like me who want to maintain creative control, who want to still, um, you know, act as an independent artist, put out our music. They give us this platform that's so spread out globally that it's, it's amazing. And, you know, this wasn't around years ago. Like everybody relied on the major labels to, to like get themselves out there, but times are changing and it's amazing. So I really have to hand it to them for letting me, you know, share my voice and my stories and have it spread on such a, a wide scale. Yeah. That's awesome to hear, and it reminds me of something like just this past week, I was at the Indie Week uh, conference here in Toronto, moderating a panel and doing some things. I remember somebody saying, and the discussion was specifically about the whole kind of streaming ecosystem, in particular uh, playlists, and they're saying it can be genre specific in terms of how easy that is to break into. And somebody is saying, you know, really within that pop, R&B, EDM, top 40 world the major labels kind of swing the big hammer or whatever mm -hmm. you know terrible metaphor you want to use yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but essentially saying like to, to break into that break into the streaming ecosystem within those genres yeah, it goes a long way to be on the major label so it's interesting and fantastic really to mm -hmm. see that you've done it on an indie label um and like you say the indie labels have always had a more equal split of royalties, given more creative control, all of that. Do you think that paradigm is shifting within the genres and worlds that you're you're within? That's no longer you have to be on the Universal Sony's and yeah. Warner's of the world to uh, to kind of do what you're doing. Totally. Um, you know, as as I mentioned before, times are changing, and and streaming has brought us so much um, music at such a fast pace, but you know, having this platform, having a wall allows me to be instantly connected with Spotify. They're super connected. So they have a great relationship, which in turn, you know, only helps me grow. But yeah, overall, it's just, it's different than it was years ago. And you don't have to be on a major. You really just, and, and like you said about specific genres, um, you know, even if you were someone who wasn't with AWOL, but you were really sticking to one genre, you can definitely be heard. Um, putting out music independently. You don't you don't need a label anymore. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, like you can you can do it and you can be heard if you stay consistent and and put out good music, of course. Before doing your solo stuff, when you were being a you know feature vocalist and top line writer for others, how did that come about? Was it through a publisher? Were people approaching you? Um, before I started, be, before you started putting out your own solo music, uh, when you were a top line writer for others, and remind me again who you were writing and collaborating with. Yeah. But I'm, I'm very curious how that how that happened. So yeah, when I was uh, when I was writing for all those feature top lines it was pretty much when I was in school. So I was completely independent. Um, Sean was actually working out most of my deals, kind of acting as my manager at the time. And yeah, I was, I was independent <laughs> for years and it didn't matter. You know, it was actually easier for the DJs I was working with because they didn't have to go through a label of all this, you know, kind of splits nonsense, which can get really, uh, complicated. Um, so it was easier for everybody. And I'm just, I'm just amazed that like the trajectory just continued to mm -hmm. kind of spiral up so that when I did drop my first 
Real Soul single like Bad Habits, pushed it to radio. It went gold and it's now platinum. And I mean, I, that's still crazy to me that that was the first kind of single I put out and we gained so much traction. But I'm just, I don't know, I have really awesome fans and they're diehards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how different for you is it to be writing for yourself, putting out music in your voice with your name on it? That's really of and about you, know what I mean, in comparison to that top line writing, what you're doing. Um, is it a very philosophically or, I guess, fundamentally mm -hmm. different thing for you? It's it's extremely liberating. It's also scary. Um, you know, like anything in, in life, kind of like, I always look at opposites, you know, where there's light, there's darkness, and I find that my album is full of that. There's all these opposites, and there's love, but there's also hate and anger and uh, sadness and joy. There's it's the full spectrum of emotions, and it's really, it's really my most honest, real and raw stories from, you know, stemming all the way from my childhood, and and up until now. So, being able to put out my album today, like I was in tears last night at midnight. I was, I didn't think I was gonna get emotional. I got very emotional and it kind of felt like, like a weight had lifted in a way like, okay, I, I've written these songs, I've worked on them for so long, but now they're out and now I can like let them go, you know? And let go of kind of maybe the, the crap that I was carrying as well. I'm glad you say that because when I listen to it, like two songs in particular, aside from the singles, stood out. Um, first, correct me if I'm getting the title wrong, Happy Song, Happy song. and Dear Dad, yeah. which are two songs that are obviously come from an extremely personal place. Yeah. Um, was it your intention? Has that always been your style, A, to be such an autobiographical, personal writer? Is there hesitancy on your part to, you know, a lot of people use songwriting as a form of therapy, but mm -hmm. when it comes to actually putting it out in the world and letting other people listen in on, you know, something that can almost feel like a diary, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, what, what was that for you emotionally and artistically? Was there hesitancy to, to doing that? The writing process itself, you know, I, it's, it's one of those things like when sometimes I just sit at the piano and something will pour out of me like, like it has to come out and that's why I started writing when I was younger because it was the only way that I knew how to express what it was I was going through and, and it's turned into, you know, continually being such a cathartic experience for me. Um, wait, what was I going, what was the question again? Since it was the rest of the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sometimes I just sit at the piano and something pours out and it's almost like as though it's so vulnerable for me. You know, it's it's super vulnerable. It's very personal. But at the same time, it's so real that I know that not sharing it might be a disservice to other people who might be experiencing the same thing. And for me, growing up, you know, Pink's album, Misunderstood, was like my lifeline. It saved me. So I always kind of go back to those memories and those feelings I had of, of feeling like I wasn't alone and what I was going through. And so I kind of put my fear on the back burner so that, you know, I can share my stories and people can relate to me. And at the end of the day, I want everybody to know that, like, I'm human. I know you're human. We're all the same. I see us as equals. And like, you know, even though my life may seem glamour, glamorous, I can't talk, glamorous, like at the end of the day, we're all going through the same shit, just like different degrees, you know? Does, I would imagine that lends itself to the type of relationship you have with your fans. And you mentioned how hardcore your fans and how loyal, dedicated your fans are yeah. earlier. Um, what, what's the feedback you're getting from them? I know the album just came out, so I'm <laughs> sure it's probably coming in as we speak, but yeah. just in general, in the years and all the songs you've put out leading up to this, what is that feedback and that back and forth that you have with your fans like as a result of how personal your music is? Yeah, It's pretty incredible to watch the growth and development of you know my Dirty Pretty Things family, um, which are my fans. I have many who were there from day one, and I call them my OGs. Uh, some dated like all the way back to my EDM stuff, but you know, even the people who just hopped on the ride when I started putting in my solo stuff, they've grown with me. They've watched um, me go through everything I'm going through. I'm super transparent on social media, so if I'm having a bad day and I'm in tears, 
I'll maybe take a picture or a video and like write about it and be like, hey guys, I just want you to know that, you know, on Instagram, people only show the pretty parts of their lives, but like, I want you to know that this happens too. And like, we all go through this stuff and me being so open and honest and vulnerable with them has allowed them to open up to me. So I'll get messages, long paragraphs of, you know, people telling me their own stories or how my music has helped them get through tough times or how my, you know, just honest, vulnerable post has made them feel like they can come out to, you know, say whatever they need to say to whoever they're having issues with. And, and that's one of the most special things for me is knowing that like I'm actually making a difference in people's lives and giving them kind of a sense of purpose when they feel like they're at rock bottom. Kind of reminds me of something. Um, are you familiar with the Toronto-based R&B artist Toby by chance? Toby. Like T-O-B-I. No, I'm not. Anyways, the reason I bring it up is I was talking to him for an article. I was actually writing for the magazine on artists, professional musicians, mental health, and mm -hmm. Um, why the life of a professional, especially touring musician, could be so hard on one's uh, mental health. Absolutely. <clears throat> and one of the things that Toby was saying is like, artists really need to be on social media and stuff like that, really be more honest about being like, not everything's glamorous. You're not always, you know, hashtag killing it or whatever they mm -hmm. use, the cliche. Um, yeah. That there needs to be a more open and honest conversation about mental health between artists, between artists and industry, and between artists and fans certainly sounds like mm -hmm. you know you're in line with that you're you know you feel the same way and you're yeah. and you're doing that but do you feel that a younger i guess a younger generation of artists and particularly pop stars that are coming up are just doing that more naturally maybe because you've lived your lives more are you know being, are being more authentic yeah yeah be more authentic yeah. talking about how the bad comes with the good and all of that mm -hmm. does that seem to I'm not even sure how to phrase the question, but essentially is that that honest communication coming more naturally for yeah. yourself and other artists coming into the industry now than it maybe did 10 years ago or whatever? Yeah. I think uh, I think it could actually, there could be more transparency still. I, I don't see a lot of artists being super open. Um, I mean, there, there are like Elohim... Uh, Jesse Ray's is pretty honest. There are a couple, but I do still think that the you know people who are like the top, the top tier, the ones who have the largest followings, like the Justin Bieber's, the Selena Gomez, the Ariana Grande's, and it's totally up to personal preference. You know, I I would never force that upon someone like spill your guts and you know share everything. So to each his own. But overall, I do think that that people could be a little bit more open because I know even for myself. You know, there were there were days where, you know, I'd go through Instagram and I find myself comparing myself to others and like and kind of my, you know, hearing my inner voice, self-deprecating, you know, words and and you really have to like kick yourself out of it. But that that's what kind of forced me to just be real with people. And I hope that I hope that more artists and more people with large platforms um, can just be super honest about whatever the uh, whatever it is they're going through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure once you get to the astronomical levels of fame, really, that the Biebers and the Ariana Grandes and them do, you know, roadblock or not roadblocks, but barriers between your personal life yeah, and your right? yeah. fame yeah. life needs to happen. Yeah, I I mean I can't even begin to imagine how uh, how little privacy they do have. So I understand why they might want to close that off because um, already like their life is chaos yeah. but in general yeah I just think people can be a bit more open um, it only does good you know it only is more inclusive for everybody you mentioned Pink earlier and how she was like her album um, is misunderstood am I remember yeah was a huge influence on you and really like I think you said a lifeline for you when you were younger I think she was like kind of a pioneer in the sense of this next generation of, for lack of a better term, pop stars came out yeah. and um, Lord being one of them, mm -hmm. but also someone like, uh, you know, now we're seeing with Billie Eilish or even Lana Del Rey, there seems to be a broader scope of, I guess, art that falls under the mm -hmm. pop banner. And the term pop isn't treated with the same kind of critical derision that maybe it once was in the era of Backstreet yeah. Boys and Britney Spears and all that kind of stuff. Do you think now is kind of for what you're doing, 
I guess that could be termed like art pop. This is a pretty fantastic time to, yeah. to be doing it because you're given way more breath to be a full, uh, a full artist <laughs> to, to express your, to express yourself and release music. And you can see it on your new album. Yeah. Um, how it does go from EDM to ballads and that kind of stuff and mm-hmm. how it is so personal is now really a great time to be an artist of your style, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think it's an amazing time to be um, an artist of my style. I actually, in the simplest of terms, I um, I kind of uh, put my music into this genre of dark experimental pop music because to me that just kind of encapsulates it a bit more because there, you know, there are so many, um, I'm doing this like it's a wave. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's just there's so much variation, and I love that I have that freedom to experiment. You know, dip my toes in different genres. Like the second last track on my album is like a spoken word kind of rap poetry piece, and the fact that I feel comfortable to do that, like I can, you know, and I can really step out of the box and take risks um, is awesome. I mean, I also never wanted to live inside the box. Growing up, I was like always the rebellious one, always doing things that told, people told me I couldn't do. So I think my album is a true testament to that of, of just like pushing the boundaries. And I think, I think it's a great time for artists because, you know, we do have the freedom to try other things and, uh, and people really accept it. So just to wrap it up, where do you go from here? What, what is your touring plans? And essentially, what is the, the blueprint going forward from here now that the album has, uh, like we said, literally just dropped? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm super excited about my Toronto headlining show, December 18th at the Mod Club. Um, really excited for that. And... I've got some cool collabs that are probably coming out 2020. I will let you know as soon as I can about those. Um, a bunch of shows 2020. I'm hoping to uh, get more into the American market. But to be honest, I'm just really excited to finally have this album out and ride the wave of whatever it brings to me because I just feel like I feel like there are going to be so many new opportunities and I'm, I'm ready for it all. Yeah. I'm just open and ready. <laughs> And, and sorry to tack on one kind of last serious question okay. here, but, you know, being an artist, and like so many um, artists nowadays who really came about in the studio, who, I guess, built your recording chops before you, you know, presumably built your public performance chops. What, what's that transition like be, been for you, bringing what you're doing in the studio and the great music you're making in this tight personal space yeah. and then performing it? Because, you know, obviously performing on stage in front of a crowd is a whole different thing and you, uh, yeah. with a whole lot of other elements to it than you know just stepping up to a mic and singing. Yeah. So how was that transition for you going from studio to public performance? Nerve-wracking as hell. Oh my gosh. No, it's it's so crazy. Uh, it's it's a lot easier to get up and sing than it is to like get up and speak. So for me, my terror was in like, oh my God, in between songs, I have to talk to the crowd. And like, that just gave me so much anxiety. Um, obviously with more experience and practice, and I, I played a bunch of shows this year that got a lot easier. But even just vocal technique, you know, it's, it's way different when you're standing in a studio and you're standing still, like with my eyes closed and just so in the moment singing compared to running around, jumping, dancing on stage, trying to engage with the audience and, you know, hit those high notes and hit those low notes. Um, so it's, it's been a really great learning curve. Um, I want to say sle- seamless, but you know what, it's it's the rehearsals, it's pre- preparation is so key. And I know people say that all the time, but practice makes perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for me, I need to be super prepared over practice um, to really nail those those shows, but it just gets easier and easier as you go, thankfully. I saw a video on YouTube yesterday of you with Tiesto at um, one of the huge EDM festivals down in Miami. You also performed at Jingle Ball at uh, uh, Air Canada Center, whatever it's now called. And uh, so it seems like you're really thrown into the fire in terms of essentially going from the studio to going to massive crowds. Yeah. There, there wasn't that buildup that a lot of, say, indie rock bands have where you're playing the, you know, the dive bar circuits yeah, and yeah, yeah. building up the size of your crowds. I, I just couldn't imagine what it's like to step out in front of that without that 
I guess, farm system of smaller venues, yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what was cool about about doing all the EDM stuff is that I got to perform, you know, like I'd go to a festival and I'd maybe perform one song with Sean Frank uh, or Oliver Heldens, and I got that, I got the rush of, of performing for such a large audience. Um, meanwhile, there wasn't too much pressure because it was, you know, it was one song. Um, sometimes I would have to sing over top of the track because, you know, you just don't have time um, or the ability to do sound check with some of these artists. The Tiesto performance at Ultra, that was my first Ultra Miami ever and the biggest crowd I'd ever sang in front of. So it was insane. And I think I was just talking about this with someone yesterday, how fast that moment passed by. Like the adrenaline just takes over. And, you know, I, I before I go on, I always like think to myself, like, okay, like I'm really going to enjoy this, even though I'm nervous as hell. But then it goes by so quickly. And... Um, yeah, it's just the energy from the audience is unheard of. Like it's it's wild. Yeah. <laughs> it looked like a natural. It looked like it didn't phase you at all while you were up there. But I uh, feel like we've already done one false close to the interview <laughs> yeah. there before I tacked all that on. But uh, uh, honestly, new album, Delaney Jane again. Uh, new album is Dirty Pretty Things. It is a fantastic body of work, really impressive body of work, and uh, congrats on just the really impressive success you've had as an independent artist already and apple has named you you know one of its top artists to watch and uh, there's really no doubt that huge things are ahead so congrats on thank everything you so much and honestly thank you for one of the my favorite interviews today um you. you are you are amazing and this has been one of my favorite interviews so good talking to you and thank you for caring about music the way you do thank you. that means a lot <laughs> thank you